everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, REIT Sector Head Rob Simone here. Thanks for uh, joining us for today's Real Conversation. I'm joined uh, by my colleague Josh Steiner, who you all know. And uh, we're also very thrilled to have Mark Moss joining us today. So Mark, uh, welcome. Thank you for uh, your time. Great to have you. Uh, thanks so much. It's an honor being here. You guys do amazing work. And so, uh, yeah, I'm just happy to be here. Thanks. No, that's awesome. And, and uh, Mark, so I, um, I followed you for a while. I came across you on Peter McCormick's podcast. Uh, you know, what, one of the things that we're really making a push for as a firm is kind of, you know, into the crypto world. And, and listening to you, listening to your story, um, I, I thought a lot of what you talked about and what you learned in your experiences was very foundational in, in kind of the journey into Bitcoin specifically. And so, um, I don't know, I would love, love for you to, you know, introduce yourself to the audience, talk about your story and, and kind of walk us through how, how you got there. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm looking at things like from a macro, macro perspective. And so that's kind of what I laid out on Peter McCormick's uh, podcast, which was looking through hundreds of years of history to kind of figure out where this next decade is going. So um, that's um, I have a big, wide macro lens. But um, kind of how I got started was that um, I got started uh, just kind of blue collar work ethic just kind of got going. I grew up from a kind of a non-traditional home. My dad was a, was a, was a contractor, uh, son of a farmer. So he was kind of a farmer contractor, super hard worker. Um, and, uh, you know, he made me work pretty hard and, and, and I kind of saw this entrepreneurial vision. And so right after high school, I started buying, um, bank owned repos from the, from the bank. Um, and at the time this was, uh, California had just kind of come out of this, uh, 89 and 92 was this big uh, real estate crash that California had had. And so by 95, um, the banks were sitting on all these repossessed homes. And um, I started buying them from the bank, zero down. And I didn't even have any money. Uh, and so they were selling them zero down. I, the first one I bought was a $80,000 duplex. And I needed like $3,000 for closing costs, which I didn't even have that. Um, so I had a partner and we collectively came up with the money and we did the work ourselves. Uh, but we made like 30 grand on the first deal. And I just rolled it in the next and the next and the next and the next. And um, over the course of the decade, I built up, you know, a, a multi eight figure uh, portfolio in real estate done really well. But I also started a lot of business um, stuff as well. And I had to start a high tech medical equipment business. Um, and then uh, I kind of was um, involved a little bit in the late 90s of this uh, this crazy period. My roommate had quit his job and we were doing these things, trading these weird things called Internet stocks back then. <laughs> um, and uh, he quit his job and I was already, you know, this investor and we we're trading these internet stocks and kind of rode that, that whole dot-com bubble up. And then obviously there was the big crash. Um, I just missed it like this much. I had uh, uh, another friend and partner had set up, a, we had to run our own servers back then. You didn't have like cloud hosting. And so we had our own these servers set up in my office and we were building out this like uh, reward shopping site. Um, we thought we we're going to get rich. And if we were like a month earlier, we might have been, but the market crashed on us. Um, then 2001, I had this bright idea to like set up an e-commerce business and sell stuff online. Um, there was no Shopify, nothing like that. I had to, um, I think I spent like 25 grand to hire a developer to build this e-commerce site. And I went to these companies and I said, hey, I built this website. I want to sell your products on my website. And they laughed at me. Hey there, Hedgeye Nation, or if you're not part of Hedgeye Nation, thanks for watching Hedgeye on YouTube. If you haven't already, make sure to click on the button below there, subscribe to our YouTube page. You can also follow the link in the description to our website to get even more great investing content. No one will ever buy anything online. That's ridiculous. And I'm like, well, I think they will. And I spent all this money and I'm just happy to buy your products. And if I don't sell them, it's on me. And I had a lot of people actually tell me, no, we don't even want our stuff being sold online. So I kind of have this perspective of having gone through that. I went ahead and pushed forward. Uh, we got it going. It was a slow grind in the beginning, built it up. A Fortune 500 exit on that as well. So I kind of had multiple businesses in multiple areas. I kept the real estate thing going. Um, but what happens at the end of the bubbles is they keep sucking more people in, right? Uh, humans were motivated by greed and uh, well, fear and pain, right? So we're, we, we rush towards pleasure. So as the markets keep rushing up, it sucks everyone in. And then of course, when it sells off, we run away from pain and we sell the bottom. But um, so it starts sucking people in and I uh, sold off both of my businesses. Um, I had over 200 rental units at one point, um, sold off all my rental units and I was all in on developing Southern California real estate, building projects from the ground up. And at the, uh, of course they started as single family homes, $80,000 homes, as I said, by the end, we're doing eight figure projects that were mixed use and uh, things like that, mixed use commercial projects. And those are four or five year projects. And um, 
2008 wasn't kind to me. We'll just we'll, we'll call it that. And uh, long story short, I got wiped out. I had looked at history. And so really, California real estate had dropped uh, really from 89 to 92 was kind of the one time and dropped about 30% over that period. The worst 12 month drop was like 6%. So I said, well, uh, risk management, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I grew up in Southern California racing dirt bikes. I've got metal in all four limbs of my body. So I'm kind of, uh, I'm kind of used to taking risks, but I'm like risk management. Well, the worst 12 month drop in history was 6%. If I doubled that 12%, if I tripled that 18%, I'm still good. 18%, 20%, no worries. It dropped 60% in 12 months. And uh, I wasn't prepared for that for a bunch of reasons why um, the real estate market was way differently, uh, way different back then. And I know uh, I heard Josh talking about the difference in the real estate market then versus now and the, and the uh, you know, affordability index, we'll call it that. And so it was just a different market back then. I couldn't carry. I got wiped out. I went from having it all. I thought uh, just married, just had a kid, brand new custom home, six car garage, elevator, whitewater views of the harbor to now being millions of dollars in debt and uh, no income. So um, Mike Tyson says everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And that was, <laughs> that was like a punch in the face from Mike Tyson. Um, and so it was devastating, obviously, right? Uh, but being the dirt bike racer that I am, and like I said, getting metal in all my limbs, I just do what I do, which is like, that sucked. Let me try this again. And um, what I realized is that I was pretty good at making money. I'd made a lot of money. But what I wasn't good at or what I didn't know was what is this whole financial system, I call it a financial casino that's going on. What is going on? How did the bankers crash the entire world? And, and, and it has massive control over my life, but I have no control over it. So I need to understand that. And so as I started really digging in into the financial system and trying to really understand that, and of course, uh, that amount of pain really gave me uh, the, the right amount of motivation to figure this out, at least attempt to. I became a gold bug. You know, I learned about sound money. I learned about the Fed and uh, endless money printing, et cetera. And um, I learned a concept. And the concept is that money is like energy. It doesn't disappear. It transfers. And so when I lost my money, somebody else got my money. And that didn't sit well with me. I didn't like that at all. And, but I also realized that if I could learn how to identify these wealth transfers, what conditions create them, how it works, I could try to position myself on the receiving end instead of on the giving end. And so I basically vowed to myself, I vowed to my family that that would never happen to us again. And I've spent the last 12 years studying wealth transfers, what conditions that happens under and you know how to read that and how to get positioned in it. And um so then uh, I've been, I, I, I kind of had to rebuild myself. I was good at making money. So luckily I could start building, making money again, started investing again. Uh, lucky for me, like I said, I'm good at making money. So I'm in a much better position today than I was before. I wish that never happened to me. But it was a good learning experience. Um, and about, uh, well, we can kind of pause there, but I, that's a lot of the motivation for what I do of creating all the content that I have, because I've lived through this a, a, a couple of times now, and I'm just really trying to share that information. Yeah, that's great. I mean, awesome intro. And and I guess as you're speaking, the maybe the natural question is like, what 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 did you learn specifically, or what was it that you found in your explanation that you had to defend against, or counteract, or or kind of hedge, so to speak? What was like your biggest learning, in your opinion? Uh, the biggest learning is just risk management, right? So um, what uh, obviously it most people kind of intuitively understand, like, don't put all your eggs in one basket sort of a thing. And so that was one really big problem that I had. And I had multifamily properties across the country, so diversified. So California went down 60%, but other places of the country didn't. Um, so if I would have kept some of that diversification, that would have been good. Obviously, not being all in one asset class would have been good as well. So that was a lot of it. Also, when it comes to real estate, and like I said, I heard uh, Josh talking recently about the affordability. And so back in uh, 2008, um, a $2 million home in Southern California was, uh, I don't know, fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars a month to, to make the payment, but the rent was about three or 4,000. Whereas today, a $2 million home in Southern California is about $9,000 a month and it rents for about 9,000 a month. And so there's the carry. Yep. So uh, one example, one of the buildings I had, it was a $12 million project. We had an offer for $11 million. I turned it down. Um, it ended up going back to the bank and uh, the bank sold it for four. 
I was trying to sell it for 12, the bank sold it for four. That building today is worth over $20 million. Mm -hmm. And so if I would have been able to carry that property, I would have been doing pretty dang good today. And so um, what I've tried to do moving forward on all my investments is one, obviously keeping the diversification, but uh, also um, on real estate, which I still am in involved in the real estate market is just making sure I can carry the properties, mm -hmm. uh, making sure the rents uh, will at least more than cover uh, the mortgage payments, plus some expenses and, and uh, <laughs> vacancies, et cetera. And, and I learned, you know, what, we, what we've seen anyway is that uh, as people lose their homes, more people go to the renting market. And so the rentals held up pretty well. And so I guess those were probably the two big takeaways from that, uh, that period. Yeah, you know, it's funny, like talking about, um, talking about rental properties, that's a, that's a hot topic in the, um, I guess I would call it the Bitcoin world amongst, uh, you know, people who are concerned about cost of living and what it means for society and um, centralization of wealth, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah. I, I recall you saying with, with Peter, um, a lot of what we're seeing right now um, should, should have us worried, but at the same time, we shouldn't be surprised. And that if yeah. you examine history, there's precedent for it. So I, I don't know, maybe, maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah. So I know you'd asked me about my, my path to Bitcoin. I can hit on that real quick and then I'll, I'll answer that question. And so I think it was like 20, uh, about 2012, I became super disillusioned with the whole financial system. Like I said, I became this like gold bug and we need to go back to sound money and, uh, you know, politics is a mess and all these things. I was subscribing to a newsletter called Sovereign Man, which is kind of really instrumental in some of my worldview. And uh, just like I wouldn't want to put all my money in one stock, like I found out, why do I want to have my whole life in one country? So it was like, kind of like this flag theory. And I was in the process in 2015 of setting up a bank account in Panama to, um, to, uh, to basically get money out of the financial system. I could work on a path to residency and then, and then citizenship. And I took another look at Bitcoin and I realized, dang, that's kind of the same thing. I can get my money out of the banking system and just put it into Bitcoin. And so I did. And so that's kind of where I got my start there. Um, as far as uh, jumping back into um, the bigger macro picture, um, what to, to the point you made, a lot of this seems very random, but but I don't really believe it is. And so, for example, most people would probably say that the last 24 months, a pandemic, <laughs> uh, you know, all of our liberties being suspended or taken away, if you will, all of these things look very random. Like who would have called that a virus would have came, right? It's a black swan event. Um, but I don't believe that it is a black swan event. Again, if you zoom out through the long lens of history. And so um, right now, today in the world, um, we have lots of countries where millions of people are in the streets protesting. All through Europe, it's big. Obviously, uh, Australia, you know, Canada, in the U.S. this weekend, there's a big march going on in the capital. And so all over the world, people are marching, protesting, pushing back. And so that looks random, right? They're protesting against mandates, right? Um, and who would have called that this virus would have come, things like that. But the reality is it's not random. And so if we look back, even before the pandemic happened, prior to the pandemic, there were 10 countries hmm. with over 1 million people each in the streets protesting. So it was already happening before the pandemic. Now they're protesting for a different reason, but they were already there protesting. And the reason why, if you zoom out and I look at an 80 year cycle and a 250 year cycle. So on an 80 year cycle, it's really about an 84 year cycle. Um, about every 84 years, we have what we call a populist uprising or a regime change cycle. You've probably heard at this point of the fourth turning, which is kind of like this generational theory, which is like an 80 year cycle. There's this pendulum cycle that's 80 years that swings between individualism and collectivism. Mm -hmm. um, but really there's this regime change. So 84 years ago was the end of World War II. Hitler, Mussolini, and in the U.S. was uh, FDR's New Deal, which kind of turned the U.S. from you know capitalist to socialist. Um, about 84 years before that, Karl Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto, the book that won't go away, um, which led to the you know European Spring, the largest revolution in history. And so, about every 84 years, this happens. And so, while well, while this looks random, no, we're right on cue for a populist uprising and a regime change. That's what the world's calling for. And if we zoom out even more. Uh, if we look, what's interesting is if you look at like the world of mathematics, like if you look at like technical analysis, for example, um, things work in like threes or like a triple bottom, for example. And so three times 84 is 252. 
And on a 250 year time frame, we have a revolution cycle. So every 250 years, we have a revolution. So 250 years ago was the American and French Revolution. 250 years before that was the Protestant Reformation. We can dig into those, but what they really um, they mean to me when I look at them is they were rejecting centralization and they're moving to decentralization. So they in the American Revolution, we rejected the centralization of the monarchy and we set up a decentralized government, a republic. 250 years before that was, you know, rejecting the centralization of the of the church and state. And uh, it, it set up a decentralizing government as well. Um, and so, again, 250, here we are right on cue going through this revolution cycle. And in these 80 year cycles, as I said, we kind of oscillate between a pendulum from individualism to collectivism or centralization, if you want to call it that. And every 250 years, again, there's a revolution against centralization. And I think it's pretty easy for anyone that's even halfway paying attention to see that we are at peak centralization right now, peak globalization. So World Economic Forum, World Health Organization, World Trade Organization, World Meteorological Association, IMF, UN, etc. cetera. Um, and so that's what's happening. That's just where we are in the cycle. We're approaching that peak. The pendulum is topping out. We can see all over the world that people are pushing back against that. They want their individual freedoms back and the world will start to pendulum back. I mean, that's the that's the big idea that I kind of broke down on Peter's uh, podcast. Yeah, that, that I mean, that's fascinating. Thank you for that. And I, I guess I'll have one more and then um, I think Josh may have a, a question to lob in here. But um, with, you know, at, at the same time, we're at peak centralization. It seems like, um, you know, as our colleague, our colleague, Neil Hal actually wrote the fourth turning, by the way. So it's funny you should. Yeah. You mentioned that he, um, it's, it's always great to kind of like bring um, different perspectives around that together as it relates yep. to Hedge Eye. But, you know, we're at peak centralization, but it seems like we're also at um, peak distrust of that centralization, right? At, at the same time, people are pushing back. So I guess it maybe may starting to shift it more to Bitcoin. Is, is Bitcoin more of a way of pushing back or more of, in your mind, more of a way of preparing for what comes next? Like, how, how do you kind yeah. of, Think of a framework around that. Yeah, so this is where it starts getting really interesting. Yeah. So yeah. in my opinion, so um, as a analyst, financial analyst, you're looking for indicators, and you're looking for multiple indicators, um, not just one. One indicator is not conclusive. And so um, a lot of people are looking at this financial market, which of course we're all looking at, and we can see that the financial market is ready to be reset on about an 80-year time frame. We have a financial revolution or financial reset. So 80 years ago was Bretton Woods, Bretton Woods agreement. Um, and now the IMF is calling for Bretton Woods too, right? And so we're kind of right there. And I think, so a lot of people are looking at that. That's one indicator. Um, we can look at the political revolutions as I called like the 250 year cycle. That's another indicator. But then we have a, on about a 50 year time frame, we have a technological revolution cycle. And this is so uh, one's a 250, one's a 50 year, and one's an 80 year, but all three are converging right now at the same time. So back to Bitcoin. So um, I believe that solutions should come to problems. Uh, today, we have a bunch of money chasing a bunch of made up problems, but typically solutions come to problems. And so um, the world, the problem that we have is too much centralization. And the world is rejecting that. The world wants to swing back, um, the pendulum swing back. And um, at the same time, we have this technological revolution that's bringing us this um, solution. Now, when I say technological revolution, I'm not talking about a technology. I'm not talking about the iPhone or Uber. I'm talking about a revolution that changes the way the world works, changes the course of humanity, and builds new financial markets. So we had the Industrial Revolution. We had about, about 50 years later, we had the um, steam engines and uh, railways. So all of humanity, we had horsepower, manpower. Now we had steam engines. That was a big deal. Uh, then we had steel and electricity. So of course, obviously that changed the world. Now at the time, electricity was like a digital candle. What do we need electricity? The candle has been light for 5,000 years and look, it's portable, right? Um, but of course, electricity was so much more than that. Steel allowed us to build skyscrapers and bridges. Then we had the age of uh, oil and automobiles and mass production. So for all of humanity, people walked and rode horses and now we had cars. Transportation was pretty cool. Um, about seven, about 50 years later, we had 1971 was the age of the microprocessor, which brought personal computers, which brought cell phones, which brought telecommunications and internet like we're doing today. 
1971 plus 50 years puts us right here today. And I believe we're on the edge of another technological revolution. And what that technological revolution is, is decentralization, which of course is interesting. The revolution is bringing us decentralization at the very point on a political, social, cultural level, we're rejecting centralization and are trying to move back to decentralization. So we kind of have right when the pendulum is swinging and we need it, the technology, the revolution appears and we have it. That's fascinating. Josh, I think you had a question to, to lob in. Yeah. Hey, Mark. So uh, first off, I, I think this is really interesting. And I, I kind of wish we could go on like this for hours just talking about the historical <laughs> context because there's Same. so many different ways you can go with that. But um I guess I'll, I'll sort of leapfrog us in a, in a little bit of a different direction here. Um, so, you know, we deal primarily with institutional investors. And, um, uh, you know, one thing that's surprising to me, um, and I don't know if you've sort of run across this uh, much, but it's just, you know, the lack of familiarity, the lack of understanding of um, what we'll just sort of generally call the crypto market. And right. specifically, you know, I think um, as people are sort of beginning to, you know, look into it, uh, sort of ask questions about it, um, one of the things that I think is just not well understood really is the difference between Bitcoin and what we sort of think of when we talk about crypto. Um, so maybe you could spend a minute or two just kind of explaining how those things are different and uh, why much of what you're describing and talking about uh, maybe lends itself uh, more to one versus the other. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd sure love to talk about that. So mm -hmm. um, again, solutions come to problems. So what are the problems? The problem is centralization. Mm -hmm. The problem is one group of people, um, a group of humans, men that uh, are changing things arbitrarily. One group of people that have control over the money supply. Now, of course, we can talk about different central banks, but really we have the IMF and the BIS up on top of that. So we have the centralization of the money supply. That's a big problem. Um, the, and, and in my opinion, if we look at a giant oak tree with 10,000 leaves, every leaf on that tree is a problem from obesity rate to incarceration rate to divorce rate to uh, income inequality to supply chains breaking down. They all boil down to this money printer uh, I'm an, from the Austrian lens, right? It's the money supply inflating that causes these distortions in the market. Um, so really, that's kind of the key piece. Um, but then also some things that we have is that uh, censorship is a big problem, not just that I can't say what I want on, on YouTube or Twitter, but that even even with my own private property, my own money, the Fed can print more of it. So they're inflating it, they're stealing it away. And if I wanted to send it to you, they could stop it, block it or prevent it. So PayPal teamed up with the Anti-Defamation League to create a list of black addresses that people shouldn't get payments. Um, and we see you know, credit card companies blocking people all the time. So I'm censored even in my own private property. And then uh, another big problem, and they all boil back down to the money supply. But another big problem is um, like, rule of law. So um, the constitution was a rule of law and that rule of law was simple to understand and it was set in stone. So I could plan my life and you could plan your life. But today we're, we have a, a, a rule of men where they arbitrarily change the rules all the time. I've been holding live conferences now and my sister said, why don't you do it in California? I'm like, can I have a thousand people inside in California in six months from now? And she's like, I don't know. <laughs> right. So we don't know. We have these changing rules. And so um, if that to me seems to be the big problems that we need to solve. And so then I, we, the solution would be something decentralized that nobody can control. We need something that's censorship resistant that nobody could stop, block or prevent. And we need a set of immutable law that can't be changed, not governance. And so if, if I believe that those are the problems and solutions we need, and then I look at all 15,000 cryptocurrencies that could solve those problems, I only see one. So let me give you an example of this. There's a there's a bunch of ways we could take this, but from stay, trying to stay a little bit high level, um, unlimited money supply. That's a problem. So Bitcoin has a fixed supply, 21 million. Now there's other ones that have there's a few others that have fixed supply caps as well, but Bitcoin has 21 million. Uh, one of the big complaints with Ethereum is that we don't know what the monetary supply is. So about five or six months ago now, Vitalik Buterin and boys got together and they changed the monetary issuance. But that's the problem that we have today, people that have the power to change the monetary system. We want a system that's immutable that nobody can change, 
right? So that that's a big one, I think. Um, imagine, and so I think you have to understand a bunch of things about Bitcoin. One of them is that how does monetary systems work, but also how does technology work? And so the monetary system was started with gold as a base settlement layer, and then paper gold certificates as like a layer two, checks layer three, credit cards layer four, et cetera. And so if Bitcoin is a base settlement layer, we can also scale in layers. And that's also the way technology works. So we have like a TCP IP protocol, which transfers the data packets of information, like what we're doing now over the internet. And then on top of that TCP IP protocol, that tra- it's, a, it's a very basic rule. No, it can't be changed and it transfers data. And we have trillions of different applications that are built on top of that protocol. Um, now, what would happen if that protocol were to change? All of that goes away. Now, Bitcoin is also a protocol. Bitcoin is also a transfer protocol for value that trillions of applications can be built on. And you don't want that application, you don't want that protocol to change. And so when you have Cardano that has decentralized governance, we don't want governance. Who gets to decide to change it? Oh, the person who stakes the most tokens. Okay, where'd they get the most tokens? Oh, in a pre-mine. So that sounds a lot like the Federal Reserve System that we have today. We want a system, a, a fixed rule, a fixed set of protocol that can't be changed, that we can build an entire system on that nobody can go back and change. So uh, that's that's probably from a high level a big difference, in my opinion. Yeah, I think th- th- when you put it that way, I think it makes a lot more sense for people, um, just the idea of what's truly decentralized and uh, what isn't. And maybe as a, like a follow-on to that, um, a friend of mine, uh, we were going back and forth on this a little bit, and he put together a pretty good analysis where he went back and he looked at the top 10 coins um, from December 31st, 2017. And uh, if you had put you know, 10% of your money in each of those top 10 coins back then, what would it be worth today? And it's, it's pretty interesting. So I've got some numbers in front of me. Um, so overall, uh, you would be up 34%, but that's over four years. So that's not very good. Uh, Bitcoin uh, through the 1st of uh, January, 2022, up 257%. Um, if you took Bitcoin out of the top 10, then the other nine would be up 9%. And if you took Bitcoin and Ethereum out, uh, the other eight would be down 41%. Yeah. So the, the question is, um, you know, in, in your opinion, do you think part of the reason why um, sort of there's this sort of view that Bitcoin uh, is the superior asset uh, among these many choices. Is it partly because it's sort of stood the test of time and it's generated the returns and those who've been around the longest in the crypto world have sort of already been there, seen that, you know, done that and seen these other sort of would be uh, programs and, and so forth sort of rise and fall. Um, and do you think that the post 2017 timeframe is sort of comparable or not comparable? Maybe the projects today that are out there um, have greater utility or less speculative or, or is it all just sort of the same or, or similar? Uh, and that's part of what underpins, you know, the Bitcoin philosophy. Yeah, great, great question. And uh, I have a great answer for that. Um, it might not win me a lot of f- fans, but let me let me let me first preface this. So from 2016 to 2019, for about four years, I wrote, which I think is one of the top cryptocurrency research newsletters. During that four-year period, I personally researched and published over a thousand pages of research on every crypto project during that time period, um, and DEXs, you know, decentralized exchanges and privacy coins and every sector of the market. Um, So a lot of people say, Mark, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, I've published a thousand pages of research on crypto projects. What have you done? So uh, uh, let me let me just say that because that that sets up my credibility for what I'm going to say next. Um, What I would say next is that it depends on the viewpoint that you're coming from. If you're an investor and you're trying to increase your U.S. dollar stack or like a trader, I guess I would say, if you're like a trader trying to increase your U.S. dollar stack or are you trying to invest into something that could be world changing? So let me give you an example. A lot of people like to trade penny stocks and a lot of people make a lot of money trading penny stocks. I don't think anybody trading penny stocks ever believes those penny stocks will probably make it to the NYSE, but they're, that's their niche and they have fun and they make money. Or I have friends that bet on the, on the, on the Sunday football games as well. Um, and so as a trader, I think there's lots of opportunity to make money in those crypto assets, you know, if you can get in and out of them. Um, but I 
but if you wanted to buy something like Warren Buffett bought Coca-Cola in 1965 or whatever, there's one asset that you would want to buy that's going to change the world. Um, kind of like if you were trading those internet assets in the late 90s, most of those just went away, right? Um, so I think it, it depends on the viewpoint. If you're just looking at it as a trader, I think a lot of those crypto assets, now you're talking about a four-year time frame and what happened there. So I think, in my opinion, and this is what's not going to win me a lot of fans, which is why I had to build my credibility first. There's a big problem that we have, centralization, censorship resistance, you know, things like that. And there's one token that solves that. There's, there's one project that solves that problem. There's just one. And the, the thing is, is remember, technology scales in layers. So in the, in the mid-90s, we had a lot of uh, public companies that said, we can't trust the big internet. We're going to build our own private intranets. Those all went away, right? And so what we can see now, uh, Bitcoin has added layer two. There's like layer three coming on board and pretty much anything that these other crypto assets could do today could be built on Bitcoin. That's one. But also, too, this is this is one that's interesting. Uh, I don't think everything needs to be decentralized. So I think like video games, that's really cool. Do video games need to be censorship resistant, immutable, and decentralized? Because like, there's a lot of money. Don't get me wrong. You can invest in video game companies and make billions of dollars. That's great. But does do they need to be decentralized, right? And so I I, I kind of look at that like art. That, that's cool. Like, um, should artists be able to sell their art online? Sure, that's great. But that doesn't change the world. And so when I look at it, I I think that's the difference. And so everything is competing against everything else. To your point, there's this shuffling below Bitcoin. Everything is shuffling because they're all competing on the same thing, trying to be a different version of Bitcoin. But Bitcoin is, and I guess that's probably the big difference. Mark, that was uh, that was fascinating. And um, th thinking about layers, one of the things that I heard years ago um, from a real estate investor that got me in, uh, interested in Bitcoin specifically, he compared it to um, buying a plot of land in Manhattan in like 1850. And that effectively yeah. what you're doing is you're buying like a carry free call option on all the activity that happens above that plot of land in perpetuity going forward. So what you said, I don't know if that resonates with you or not, but that's like kind of how I think about it. But um, sure. I, I mean, the, wealth, the, the wealthy build wealth by buying trophy assets mm -hmm. and just holding them forever. Right. Yeah. So buying that that plot of land in Manhattan, for example, right, holding that for 100 years. And so uh, Bitcoin represents that there's only 21 million units. Um, there's not enough for all the millionaires of the world to even own half of one. And so um, it's definitely one to store value. I think you know, kind of like the Internet. And this is this is where it's hard to understand. Remember, I, I kind of made the joke that light uh, that electricity was sort of like a digital candle. It was it was a digital candle. But it was so much more. So what happens as humans, we try to understand something by putting it in relation to something else that we know. Um, but we don't realize how much more it can become. So, for example, the Internet was sort of like a way we could send electronic messages. So email was the killer application at that time. Of course, today, we, we didn't know at that time that our car would be hooked to something called a cloud using something called social media, to, like navigate us around. Um, and so today money is the killer application for Bitcoin, but it's the network. It's a value transfer protocol, just like the TCP IP is a, is an information protocol. And so we could have, you know, trillions of use cases built on top of that new decentralized platform or network that we have no idea about today. Yep. That's fascinating. Yeah, no, that, that's really awesome. I, I guess, uh, you know, we're, we're about halfway through. Maybe two more questions for me, and then we, we want to uh, open it up to our listeners who are, you know, eager to ask questions. That's going to be fun. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. I have a queue, a queue lined up for you. So some will be, yeah. uh, some will be more fun than others. But, um, you, you know, you, you touched on it before. Uh, we, we had Jeff Booth um, talking with our CEO, Keith McCullough, a couple, couple weeks ago. And yeah, there was one he's a good friend. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's great. Uh, I, you know, m kind of must read in the space, uh, in my opinion. But he, um, one question that came up in that, uh, that podcast or, or that session was the difference between uh, proof of stake and proof of work. And I think yeah. that there, there are many important, there are tra one thing that I've learned is there are trade-offs, right? Like everything in blockchain it involves trade-offs. So I don't, maybe, maybe speak to, and you, you touched on proof of stake before, maybe speak to some of the trade-offs in your eyes between the two systems so people understand it. 
So if people really want to understand it, what I would do is I'd point them to Lynn Alden's work. She wrote a paper a couple of weeks ago, and it was literally proof of stake versus proof of work. It's about an hour read. Um, and uh, if you really want to know, read that. I can barely do that justice in a couple of minutes. <laughs> um, but, but, but what I would say is that um, the difference of proof of work, obviously, Bitcoin uses proof of work, which means that I have to buy equipment, CapEx, um, I have to set it up and I have to run it. Now, the difference is that every the Bitcoin network is fair. It's open. It's permissionless. So anybody can join it. Anybody could go buy a mining computer today, plug in the network and start earning Bitcoin. Um, and their proof of work is I have to spend energy. I have to buy the CapEx, I have to buy the equipment, and I have to spend energy every single month in order to participate in the network. There's a couple of things that that does. One, it enables me or it incentivizes me to be a good actor. I could try to maliciously attack the network, but then I would lose the amount of money that I'm putting in. Um, but the bigger thing is that if you look at something um, that would that would emerge as money, so money is an emergent thing, right? So it started as a barter system. And then um, if you didn't want my chicken or my goat, then well, how about this other item? And so then we started having mediums of exchange. And then eventually we settled on gold and gold worked really well for a bunch of reasons, portable, divisible, durable, but scarcity is one of those. And so because in order to get gold, it requires me to expend energy. I have to go find land, I have to get equipment, I have to spend time, energy, et cetera, to produce that gold. There's a cost to producing that capital. That cost is what prevents me from creating more from thin air. And so we have to have a true cost of capital and Bitcoin is similar to gold where I have to expend time, money, energy, resources in order to produce that. So it keeps that scarcity level there. Um, and it, and it, Everybody has to spend that money. They have to prove they're working. Now, with proof of stake, there's a couple big flaws with that. Obviously, like I said, Len does a great job breaking this down. But a couple of things would be one, as I highlighted earlier, whoever stakes the most tokens gets the most say in the network. Whoever has the most Bitcoin gets no say in the network. So you can accumulate as many, you can corner the market in Bitcoin. It doesn't mean you have no special privileges. But if you have more, more Ethereum tokens or Cardano tokens, you do. And so that's a big difference. And of course, they gave themselves those tokens or the Fed can go acquire a bunch of tokens and have control of that network. Um, but the other thing I would say is how the network, how they work fundamentally. And so uh, the big thing that makes Bitcoin so special and make it and actually makes it so decentralized is that the entire database is only about plus or minus 300 gigabytes. You can put that on a thumb drive. And so everybody can run a node. A node would be the entire database. And so I have one sitting right over there. You buy a little device, you put it onto your Wi-Fi, you're running a node. And so there's, they're everywhere. Everyone can run a node. But with Ethereum or Cardano, you can't really do that. Now, if you're a data scientist, then you can set up your own commercial server in a commercial co-location facility, maybe. Um, so there's very few of them. The average person can't do that. And so that's one of the big differences with the proof of work versus the proof of stake, in my opinion. But again, go back and read Len's paper if you really want to dig into that. No, that's awesome. Thanks, Mark. And, and actually, uh, I, I have one more, and then Josh has one more after me before we go to Q&A. Yeah. But um, our, so, OK, so the, the, the meat and potatoes of, of why we're talking about this, like all of our, all of our subs are, are investors, right? They care about yeah. um, what the asset can do over some duration. So yeah. um, ma many different frameworks to think about price and value. Like what, what's, what's your price framework? Like what do you think about the opportunity? How do you size it up? Yep. So it depends on the, the viewpoint that you're coming in with, right? Are you a trader or are you an investor? So do I want to be Warren Buffett and sit on something for 60 or 70 years, or am I just trying to trade in and out of positions? Um, I believe uh, there was a report I saw a few weeks ago. They said that uh, the more information that an uh, investor receives, the worse their performance does. And uh, Charlie Munger says that the big money is not made in the buying and selling, it's made in the waiting. And uh, Warren Buffett said that if a new investor would come into the market knowing they only had 20 moves their entire career, they could outperform everybody else. So I take that viewpoint. Again, I've been studying these wealth transfers for a, a, a dozen years now. So I'm looking for big moves that I can get in front of. And then it, it's going to take years for those things to play out. So that's just my time frame. I was a real estate investor. As I said, those projects take four or five years. I'm an early stage venture investor. So I'm used to letting things sit for years. Um, if you're a trader, it's different. So I just want to kind of frame that up. 
Um, in regards to Bitcoin uh, and where I think that plays out, I don't really think short term on it. So I'm not really going to tell you where I think it's going to go over the next couple of months. Although I'm guessing that one, we have this, uh, the amount of institutional uh, players that have come into the market have sort of kind of co-opted it. And it's kind of moving with the stock market right now. And with the Fed monkeying around with the system, with the rates and, you know, threatening, uh, th threatening to, uh, uh, taper and then the three rates this year. I think that's kind of messing with the short term price. What I would say over the long term, I think we have a 10x in front of us over the next five years. Um, I think we have uh, even you know double that over the next 10 years. And the reason why is because again, when you understand what it is, it's like the best store of value that we have. And when people would say, well, Mark, what do you mean it's a store of value? It was 69,000 and now it's at 40,000. Well, um, you don't want to look at the highest point. Look at how the lowest points, the consolidation points have moved up. Every year since its inception, the lowest point every year has been higher, except one year in 2015. So it's been a great store value. It's been highly volatile, of course. Um, that's a good thing. Um, so I think it's been a great store value. But even more importantly, the reason why it's a good store of value is that nobody can inflate it. Or, see, or steal it from me. Nobody can take it from me. And so that's why it's a really good store of value. The oldest problem that mankind has had is how do I protect my private property? Since day one, you're going to come take my chickens or my goats, right? Since day one, how do I secure my property? And we finally solve that problem. And so it's a great store of value. Um, and I think what happens is um, really since we got off the gold standard, we've forced the average person to become an investor to try to beat inflation. And most people just want to be a good brain surgeon or, or go cure cancer or, or whatever it is. They don't want to have to spend all this time investing. And so when they start realizing that, they'll start, I think more money will start being allocated to um, Bitcoin. And then I think the governments and the central banks are going to continue to help market that. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, my outlook is that they're going to have to continue to increase stimulus. Um, when you look at the entitlements that we have and the, the situation that we have there, uh, you know, short term, maybe they can pull back, but long term, they're going to have to keep printing. Um, everyone has their breaking point. If you're in Venezuela with 2,500% inflation, you're out. You're moving to Bitcoin or gold or batteries, something. Uh, you're seeing the same thing in Turkey. The U.S. at 25% a year. I mean, the, the water's not quite hot enough, but over the next three, four, five years, in my, this, as I said, I'm kind of looking at this 10-year period. I think things climax in the next four to five years. And I think the, the water is going to be hot enough. People are going to be jumping out. And so that's kind of why I'm looking at that five-year time frame. Got it. Got it. Josh, I think you had a question. Yeah. Hey, Mark. So um, I guess a, a follow-up on that and then just sort of something a little bit different. But, you know, there's different frameworks that I've come across out there um, just for thinking about, you know, what is sort of a, I guess you'd call it like a longer-term fair value uh, type of framework for what Bitcoin might be worth. So there's like stock to flow and there's sure. the Metcalf approach. And I'm curious if you've sort of spent time on those, if, if you think there's merit to those, or if you've come across other things uh, that you think work better or are just make, you know, better intuitive sense. Yeah. Um, and then I guess on, a, on an unrelated note, you know, one of the things I've sort of been thinking about more lately, and, and I imagine you've given it a fair amount of thought, uh, it's just the game theory aspect of Bitcoin and the idea that, you know, El Salvador is a first mover from a country standpoint. And, you know, just like we have this saying internally that comes up all the time, uh, which is that sort of risk happens slowly than all at once. Right. Yeah. You, you get this this sort of um, cascade dynamic. And so it is an interesting sort of thought experiment. Right. Which is, you know, if, uh, you know, a second country and then a third country, you know, comes on board, you know, does that at some point trigger this sort of this domino effect? And then all of a sudden, you know, it's just kind of everybody, uh, you know, you get you this critical threshold and all of a sudden, you know, you get this phase transition. So curious uh, your thoughts on, on those things. Yes. Yeah, so um, on the valuation model, there's, as you said, a bunch of ways to look at that. Um, I don't like to look at technical analysis from that, but there's other factors. And so you mentioned stock to flow. Um, I think that's a I, th I think it's it's very interesting. Um, again, it's it's one single indicator. So you don't put a lot of weight into one single indicator. But I think there's definitely some merit to it. It's, um, you know, potentially it's been kind of uh, broken at this point or, you know, plan B still thinks that maybe is within a variation or deviation, I guess. But um, that's one indicator. And I think it's an interesting way to look at it. Um, but I think there's a lot more to it than that. Um, the typical framework that I think about it in 
would be back to kind of more of like a venture investor. And so if you were pitching me on Uber um, way back in Silicon Valley, whatever, a decade ago, um, I've never heard of Uber before. I don't know what it is. And you're like, well, here's what we're thinking. It, it, if the taxi industry is this big and the limo industry is this big and the van share ride share is this big and we were able to take 2% of each one of those markets, here's where we could be. So I kind of approach it from that angle. So if I go, I mean, Citibank and JP Morgan have been putting out guidance saying it's going to overtake gold. Okay, well, gold's 13 trillion or whatever, 10, 11 trillion today. So they say it's going to overtake it. Well, what if it just gets 10% of that? Okay, well, that's 2 trillion or whatever, a trillion and a half. Um, um, they, they call it like a Swiss bank account in your pocket. Um, we know that Swiss bank accounts aren't what they used to be. We see Russian oligarchs getting their accounts seized all the time. Um, they can't move it. It's not portable. So it's it's a better Swiss bank account, in my opinion. As I, I told you my story, I was going to open an account in Panama. I decided to go to Bitcoin instead. There's 30 to 40 trillion sitting in offshore bank accounts. Could it get 10% of that? Um, right. And then um, how many people are investing into real estate or stocks that... I sold a lot of my real estate over the last year and I put it all into Bitcoin. I didn't want to manage it. I'm kind of rotating back into real estate right now a little bit, but a lot of my real estate money just went into Bitcoin. Um, so how much can it take from real estate? How much can it take from stocks? Um, and then we have the bond market, whatever it is. I don't know at this point, uh, you know, 15 trillion of negative yielding bonds. I mean, can it absorb some of that? So I start to look at all these different financial assets and then how does it compete with each one? How did Uber compete with the limos? How did Uber compete with rideshare? Um, and so how does it compete with each asset class and how much could it pull from each one? And when you look at it from that lens, it's massive. Uh, Greg Foss, I don't know if you guys have got a chance to talk to Greg Foss. Uh, he's a you know career bond trader and he has a he has an actual formula he's broken down based off of using like the credit default swap market um so i think that's a very interesting way to look at it but ultimately like i said i think this venture framework has been uh most helpful for me um what was the second part of the question sorry yeah, just just the game theory aspect oh, the game theory game theory yeah so so game theory is is actually something i'm super excited about so um, looking at the long lens of history, what we can see is there's these mega political shifts that really changed the world. And so in the 1500s, I mentioned the Protestant Reformation. It was the creation of the printing press about 70 years before that is what caused the breakdown of the of the church's um, stranglehold on that. And even though they said anyone who speaks out against that will, will die, heresy, they'll be put to death, they couldn't stop it. And then um, things blew up. We went to the Renaissance age. Um, we had all this explosion of science tech, the, the industrial revolution started, which centralized things. Um, but now we're seeing the internet and Bitcoin are starting to decentralize again. So there's this, this they can't stop it. But as I said, this world is trending towards uh, centralization or authoritarianism or totalitarianism. And um, it's scary because we're starting to see a lot of technology giving them the tools they need to kind of really uh, crank down on that with social credit scores and central bank digital currencies. I don't believe that it's a war or guns that solve that problem. I think it's competition. So game theory, to your point, um, it's competition. So we saw Texas and Florida outcompete California and New York. Both governors found themselves on the chopping block. One made it, one didn't. Um, but we've seen all these people. We saw Meta announced, I think, two weeks ago they're moving to Texas. So they've, they've outcompeted. But what happens when nations start outcompeting? And so the reason why I started with this mega political shift is because um, the industrialization um, centralized everything. So I created big factories, big warehouses inside of one country sort of a thing, right? But today with the internet, I can live anywhere I want. And so I know you're real, you know, you guys are real estate guys. So people are moving to Wyoming and Idaho and Colorado. They could never go there before there was no jobs, but today they can internet, but they can also move to El Salvador. They can also move anywhere they, in the world they want. And so just like Texas and Florida outcompeted when nations start outcompeting. And so um, El Salvador is the first one to adopt it. Um, I think all eyes are on El Salvador. I think, in my opinion, it's very important that it succeeds because all these other nations are probably watching and going, shoot, should we do this, right? Um, but back to game theory, what um, the president of El Salvador, I think he's been bitten by the Bitcoin bug. He announced no more mandates, no more, um, you know, no more mandates, no more testing. You, you can take the medicine if you want, but we're not forcing it. Um, we've created these economic zones where you can come, no income taxes, no capital gain taxes. He said, come, make as much money as you want. Come live free. And there's a lot of investment capital that's being 
that's that's fleeing heading towards that country they're doing their own bond at this point and which i think will be oversubscribed and i think in my opinion i hope back to the game theory is that if this bond is oversubscribed if this investment capital keeps going if a bunch of entrepreneurs really head down there like we're already seeing the country next door is going to go well us too <laughs> And then the next one is, well, well, us too. And then eventually so many people have left uh, the U.S. or whatever, where the U.S. may go, shoot, we should probably rethink some of our regulations. And I think it's that game theory that eventually starts to turn the tide of the way the world's going. That's awesome. Okay, so we, we have about uh, 10 minutes left. Um, I want to turn it over to our, uh, our audience here for some Q&A. Um, so I'll, I'm just going to run through all of these. Uh, it's, it's a wide range of questions. Um, <clears throat> maybe the first one. Mark, uh, building off of, off what you what you said uh, from Dr. Jeff Ross in Colorado Springs. I don't know if you know uh, Jeff. He's a, an avid Twitter guy on uh, following Hedgeye. But hey, Mark, it's fun to see another quote unquote Oss brother, Foss Moss and Ross, <laughs> <laughs> on uh, yeah. on Hedgeye. <laughs> what do you think will be the role of Bitcoin in the world ten plus years from now? A solid reserve asset, the world's reserve currency. Do you see it as a complement or a replacement of government fiat currencies? So um, I believe, and, and this is a bigger conversation, but as I said, there's these mega political shifts, which we're going into one right now. The world is going to start decentralizing, not just out of the cities, but even out of the countries. And so the world will start being a lot more decentralized. Everyone's asking for a centralized answer. Will the dollar remain the reserve currency? Will we? Will it be the Chinese yuan? Will we go? Will it be an SDR, CBDC? Or will we go back to gold? But they're looking for a centralized answer, I believe, to the question in 10 years from now. I think things peak out in the next four to five years, meaning peak centralization. I think the pendulum starts swinging down. By the end of the decade, uh, back to the fourth turning, shout out to uh, Hal, um, all the change happens in the fourth turning, which is this decade. Um, I believe by the end of the decade, we really start to see the decline and the downsizing of the giant nation state. And so while the dollar will still be there and still be used, um, a lot less people will just be using it. So I am already on a Bitcoin standard. We have S&P 500 companies like, um, like Michael Strategy on it. And now we have nations like El Salvador on it. So in 10 years, I think the nation states are way smaller. Uh, I think the dollar is still around. I think a majority of people have probably moved over to like a Bitcoin standard like we've already started seeing. Got it, got it. Um, I, there, I think there are two questions emailed in. Uh, Josh was gonna answer, uh, ask these two from a client of ours who just uh, emailed them in. Yeah, so um, let's see. Uh, first question is, um, what are your thoughts on NFTs uh, I can't, this is their question, I can't understand paying millions for virtual land, for example, am I missing something or is this as ridiculous as it seems? And then the follow-up question is, uh, what is the best Bitcoin cold storage device? So um, NFT, so right now, the way they're being used you know, for collectibles, JPEGs, things like that, I think is, um, I don't want to say it's a little bit silly, but um, we know that, you know, People store their value, they store their wealth in collectibles. Uh, I have a younger brother, his career, what he does is he sells Pokemon cards online. People have been collecting baseball cards and, and coins forever. I haven't. I'm not a collector. I don't collect baseball cards or coins or Pokemon cards. Um, and so I'm not into the whole you know digital ape thing. Um, but as a collector, I guess there's something there. Um, but I just look at it the same way just like baseball cards or whatever. I think it's getting crazy high valuations um, because of the speculative mania that we're in today. I also think that it's not really what NFTs will be. I think in the future, NFTs will be like inside of a video game. I can own something, um, an asset inside of there. I'm also seeing NFTs being thrown around very generally. So for example, um, one of the email newsletters I got yesterday was saying how these NFTs could be used in real estate and an NFT could be, you could take a property and you could tokenize it with NFTs and people could buy those, those tokens, those NFTs. And I thought, so is that sort of like when I own an apartment and I create an LLC and people could buy shares? <laughs> it's the same thing. You can call it whatever you want. What is it like? So like they're playing up the hype here and to the average unsuspecting investor, they get caught up in the mania. Oh, this is groundbreaking. Really? Cause like I can own a share of a property today. So I think about it in those, in those terms. And so I think there's, I think beware of the hype and the mania because none of it is really that groundbreaking in my opinion. Um, uh, the second question was, uh, oh, that best way to hold it. So, uh, best is a, is a relative term. Um, 
Cold storage would be a hardware wallet that holds your key. So it'd be like a Trezor, Ledger, Cold Card are probably the top three there. The best way, in my opinion, is to do a multi-signature setup. So you would have three keys and you would need two of the three to sign a transaction or three of five. You can set that up on your own or um, I work with a company called Unchained Capital. They have like a concierge service and they'll walk you through it. If you have a lot of money, you don't want to screw it up and get it wrong. Yep. All right. That, that's great. Um, so this is from uh, Jürgen from Vienna, Austria. <clears throat> and actually, I picked this one because I, it came up with Eric Weinstein on uh, Peter's podcast about uh, the need to, even among you know decentralization, to have to build things at, at some point for us to build. And so, Mark, how long is the time frame for your decentralization in light of the fourth turning cycles calling for stronger institutions for the coming generations? How long until we call for stronger institutions? Yeah, like how, what's the, I guess, what's the, uh, the duration uh, over which things decentralize before we have to build institutions again? I think that's the question. Um, I mean, I think it's a spectrum, right? So I think uh, just like the last 250 years we've been centralizing, now we're going to spend the next 100, 200 years decentralizing. And so it's a spectrum. It's not like an a point that we arrive to, but rather it's a spectrum that we start on. So as I said, I think we'll probably hit peak in the next uh, three to five years, and then we'll start that downward scale. Um, I think that by the end of the decade, we'll really start to see a big shift into that. Um, but I think the next 100, 200 years is decentralizing. I think the, the country, we'll start to see the country even out a lot. Uh, I'm in California. I drove uh, seven hours across California two weeks ago, and, and you drive hours without seeing anything, but then LA is super tight. But we're seeing people move out across the country because they can now, and I think we'll start to see people move out across the world. Um, so uh, I don't see... I guess to the question, when will we see institutions building again? I think we'll continue to see a further breakdown or I should say decentralization over the next you know, century. Got it. Okay, that, that's really helpful. The, okay, really, uh, really practical question from Randy in Idaho. Uh, Mark, how would you recommend for the average long-term investor to invest in Bitcoin? For example, Bitto, Crypto.com, et cetera, et cetera. What would be your recommendation? So um, there's a couple of things that you can do. One, you could look at instead of investing into Bitcoin, it could be saving in Bitcoin. Look at it that way, it's a store of value. Um, and the best way to do that would be to utilize its killer property, which is that I can self-custody it myself for the first time in history. Like I said, in human history, I can keep my property without it being stolen. And so you want to do that in cold storage. So you could use one of those platforms that you named to buy it, Coinbase, Gemini, Kraken, Swan, whatever, but then pull it off and store it on your own, which was the other question I answered, which was the cold storage. And uh, you would use, like, a, like I said, oh, I have one right here, like a little device like this that can hold your keys and um, Trezor, Ledger, cold card. Um, so the best way is to use one of those exchanges, pull it off and store it yourself. Yep. Okay, great. From uh, Barry in uh, <clears throat> Ontario, Canada, north of the border. <clears throat> Mark, other than BTC and Ethereum, what altcoins do you still see being around in 10 years? Do you have a view on that? Well, as Josh laid out the case over the last four years, you see how fast they rotate in and out. Um, if I if I had to put my money on one and let it sit there for 10 years, I mean, it's just going to be Bitcoin. If you're asking me other than Bitcoin, um, you know, maybe maybe I would guess Solana only because the amount of venture capital money that's behind it. Um, I don't think it's going to be revolutionary in the sense that it's going to free us from the centralization problem that we have. Um, it'll be some semi quasi kind of centralized with like a little bit of decentralized properties in there and potentially, um, but I would probably choose that one just because the amount of backing and manpower that it has on there, but that's not a strong conviction. Got it. Okay. Um, I am being told we're actually uh, out of time that we have to wrap it up. Ah, uh, dang. I know, Mark. <laughs> like Josh said, we could go on for hours. I wish we could. Um, from my end, thank you so much for joining us. Josh, do you have anything you want to add at the end here? No, I, I thought this was awesome. Uh, just, yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, look forward to having more conversations uh, down the line. Yeah, thanks so much. I would, I would love to, uh, I would have loved to field more questions from you, Josh. And uh, I love to, I love to kind of discuss it and, and uh, verbally spar back and forth, right? We learned so much from that way. So uh, maybe we'll get another chance at that at some point. Cool. Great. Well, Mark, thank you so much. And uh, everyone joining until next time. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. And that's a wrap.